And the thing that I found really, really rewarding and exciting was working with people who were having major health problems and being able to come in and help provide a service that really benefited their lives. Because, and I, I, you guys probably run into this all the time on at least, I would say at least a monthly basis, I'll run into two people uh, that are at the rope's end. And they're like, I have no idea what's going on with me. My doctor's prescribing me anxiety medication, antidepressants, allergy medication, on and on and on and on. And they're not getting the, to, the, to the bottom of what's happening. And so far, a lot of these people, it's self-diagnosis and getting online and figuring out what's going on. They're typing in their symptoms. They're looking at this. They're finding some fa random Facebook group of all these people that are having these weird things happen that they can't explain. And these people are like, oh yeah, I've got a mold allergy. And then they go in and they get tested from, you know, maybe an alternative medicine facility. Like, uh, can't, I can't think of any, there's quite a few in the Portland area, but they'll go in and they get tested. And all of a sudden they, they're finding that they've got a massive mold allergy and they've got some types of mold oftentimes in their blood. So it, it and then all of a the sudden they're, they go to their doctors and their doctors are like, well, we don't really, we don't really treat that. So we, we don't know what to tell. We can't help you. Literally I'm working with a lady right now. She's been texting me all day today. She went into the ER yesterday. Hmm. Um, I, I oh, went no. in and done the inspection on, uh, on Thursday. I went on Thursday and found some mold in a couple of places. It was really concentrated in her attic right above her bedroom. And it was coming down through the ventilation uh, in the pipe right in her, into her bathroom. And she was spending a lot of time in her bathroom, in her closet, in her bedroom. And she, and I don't know if you, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong on this. From what I understand, people's allergy response to mold is different. Some people mm -hmm. are very highly allergic and they will respond. They're yes. like human mold. They're like human mold detectors. They're in a room and it's like, boom, they yeah. know right away there's mold. And there's other people that they can be their smell spouse. it in the air, like outside. Yeah. 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 Or th this lady for her, her nose will just start burning her. The bottoms of her feet will start inflaming. Her face gets tingly. Mm -hmm. um, another lady, she would, you know, she would have nosebleeds. Like her nose would just start gushing blood if she was in a, in a room with uh, like stacky mattress or something like that. Yeah. And these people, they don't know what else to do because the medical industry just, it seems like the medical industry doesn't know either they don't want to acknowledge it or they just don't know how to treat it. I don't, I don't, I don't even know what the reasoning is behind it, but there seems to be a massive deficit on understanding on how to help people with mold. And I don't even know how, all I can know is, okay, I can help remediate the mold, all of your medical health issues. I don't know where to send you. I, I can say, you're probably not going to find the answer with a typical medical doctor. So you need to seek out like a homeopathic physician or alternative medicine, someone that is maybe gonna look at this in a different perspective. And I, I kind of leave it at that. I say, hey, I'm not a medical doctor. I don't give medical advice, but from what I've seen, a lot of people in this situation are not able to get the answers they're looking for. So you know, maybe consider going and looking at this. So, but that's how I got into this. And I, again, over the last year and a half that I've been doing this now, I've seen probably 30 people that their lives are turned upside down. One of them there, the lady would go into her room and she would go into anaphylactic shock. And it, it, that was at the point when I came in and, and I got their home to a place where she could come back in. Mm. But even then the experience had been so traumatizing. He was changing his job and they were moving to Utah so that they could be in a dry wow. air environment. And, yeah. and it, you know, for some people that's like, the, it, this is really, really serious for him. You know, it, you, you have a livelihood and a career and a job in a place and, and you think, well, this is where we're going to be forever. But all of a sudden you, your, your health is at stake. And the saddest part, I think for so many of these people is they begin to think they're going crazy because no one believes them. The doctors yeah. will run all these tests. This lady that I'm working with right now, her husband thinks she's going crazy. Her parents think she's going crazy. The doctors are like, you're perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with you all of your tests, your, you know, we've done a CT scan and a CAT scan and all of these things, you're perfectly healthy. Maybe this is some residual effects of when you had COVID six months ago. And the lady's like, I was having these issues before I had COVID. They're worse now, but I don't know what else to do because everyone thinks I'm insane. And my family's telling me I need to see a psychiatrist. And, and again, it was yesterday. So I, I came up with a remediation plan for him. I, I presented it to him and I, my soonest availability is two weeks out. And she said, is there any way you can get to it before then? I said, I, 
unfortunately I'm, I'm booked till then I I'm literally day to day from now until then. And she, she said, well, my husband is starting to do this right now and I don't want him to, but he's doing it. He opened things up, started rubbing things, touching things. And she immediately, that's why she had to go into the ER is because she immediately oh, wow. responded to it. So yeah, I, again, I just, I feel for people in this situation, it's like, I, again, I, I don't know enough about what you guys know. So I don't even know what to tell them on the medical side. And it, from my own experience, again, what I've seen for a lot of people is like, your responses just gradually get more and more severe the longer you're exposed. Mm -hmm. And then once yeah. you're, once the mold has been addressed or once the remediation has taken place, that doesn't mean you get better overnight. What happens is it kind of plateaus and then gradually about as long as it took you to get to this pace is about how long it takes for you to get out of this place. That's again, from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. So if it took you two years for your body to get to this place, it might take about two years for your body to get out of this place. And again, I, I don't know that I'm not a scientist, but from people I've spoken to, I have other family that have dealt with mold. And that was kind of what they said. Once they actually got rid of the mold, it took them a while to kind of get back to normal. Mm -hmm. So, Sorry, well, that can, was a long tangent. No, no, Go no, ahead. no, that that's great. I can give you, if you like a little bit of an explanation, that's kind of easy for people to understand. So one of the reasons why it affects people differently is that we all have different microbiomes. And because of that, some people won't even be sensitive to mold until they eat something different. Then as they, if they're, you know, eat too much sugar or whatever else, their immune system drops and they become more sensitive to mold. So with mycotoxins, one of the ways that um, fungi attack, it's very brilliant. All life depends on water. They break water pumps. It's just extremely efficient. They break water pumps so that your cells don't have water. And then the water goes to the extracellular space. That's where they set up shop. That's where fungi can spread. The spores can start to get through the bloodstream. So even if you, so I should say the most important thing is changing the environment, which is what you do, which is why no matter what medical interventions people do to clean the body, if they're going back to bed and breathing in mold spores from, uh, and mycotoxins from the attic, it's just going to get worse and worse, regardless of medical intervention. But the reason why it gets worse over time is that as those water pumps break down, now there are cells that can no longer get nourished with liquid. And to make it worse, it becomes like stagnant water, right? So it's, it creates more inflammation. The inflammation starts to break down the cellular pumps as well. So this is a downward spiral that people get in. And that's also why those people who have had previous mold damage are so sensitive right away. The body goes, Oh God. And then has this hyper reaction, whether it's as simple as an allergy or nosebleed or, um, uh, even arthritis that will kick up because that's again, an immune response that's happening. I know I said I would make it simple, but yeah, the basic idea is that anything fungal makes its living by breaking down water pumps, taking water for itself, and then making sure the host is uh, effectively dehydrated, even as they're flooding with water. Mm. That's interesting. So, and from your guys, again, I, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to ask, I was just, yeah. I'm one, I have a lot of questions I'd like to learn about this, but the neurological aspect of it, because I know there's certain uh, types of mold that can have neurological effects. Um, have you guys seen any stuff with people, again, nosebleeds, numbing, tingling the face? Again, I had another lady where she went into the dentist to get some dental work done and her face was numb all the time. She said, my face is numb. I can't even feel my face. And she said, the doctor was poking me and he said, can you feel that? And she said, I can't feel anything. Mm -hmm. And so numbness in the face, nosebleeds, uh, tingling in sensations or flushness, uh, burning sensations. Is that like from specific types of mold or is that, you know, what types of mold are causing that? Is that normal? Like Andrew was talking about with water pumps, um, you need healthy water metabolism in and out of your cells in the right places at the right times in order for your body to work, <laughs> including electrical signaling, which is a big part of the nervous system. And so when you have, you have these water pumps that are dysfunctional, you get major, major electrolyte imbalances. And this is why these people who have these, these kinds of neurological symptoms will often also describe that they feel constantly puffy or swollen, but they're also, they're, um, uh, it, it, they're also like either 
never thirsty at all or constantly thirsty and can't get enough water. And the, the water's like just going right through them. It's not f- filtering through in the right spaces. And you have that. So the electrolytes, which allow your nervous system to work properly, aren't getting into the right places in your body. Um, they're out of balance with each other. And then you also have like a, um, um, just the physical obstruction of a lot of the peripheral nerves from all that swelling. So um, in neuropathy, which is, you know, where people get numbness, tingling, burning, et cetera, usually in the extremities, like the feet, the hands, the face. Um, you see that a lot with uh, advanced progression of diseases like diabetes. Um, you, you can also see it, what's called an obstructive neuropathy. And it's just from swelling. Like it's from people who have too much, you know, their legs are all edematous or something like that. And then the, the, it's just, it's like a, um, a, a tourniquet around the nerves. Wow. The other aspect is the inflammation. So as inflammation goes up, the nerves oxidize, they basically rust and short out. Yeah. Wow. The, um, what, what is it's, it, it's interesting like, to me as you're talking about this, Ben, the, the, um, the parallels between like, uh, remediation in a building and remediation in a human body and, um, how, you know, you, um, like I've heard more than one contractor describe, uh, good building construction as like, you know, like, yes, you're trying to make it so it doesn't just fall over under its own weight and things like that. But, and, you know, you want the sink and the toilet and the stove in the right place, but a, the, one of the major overall factors guiding construction strategies is, uh, moving water. And like making sure that it stays outside of the structure or, you know, inside of the pipes and things like that. And, um, and I think, you know, we, we see um, uh, and hear a lot of the same stories as, as you're we telling about people who've had like disappointing experiences with a conventional medical system. Um, we, I also hear a lot of the same stories about like, uh, you know, people finding water damage in the same kinds of areas of their houses, like, you know, where the, where the roof meets the gutter or, um, you know, where there was, um, condensation in a, in a ventilation system or something like that over and over again. That, um, so I'd love to hear from you more about like how you diagnose these areas. Like how mm-hmm. do you find these pockets in people's homes and buildings, uh, where, where this stuff tends to grow. Cause I know a, a lot of like the airborne tests will pick up something in the air, but that could just be like, cause it's blowing through at that time. How, how do you, how do you find more of those, th- these things? Yeah. So I, I do a couple different processes, but if it's just a general inspection, like someone suspects that they have mold in their home, but they haven't seen it. There's a few things I'm always going to check for first. So I'm going to check closets is like a notorious place where mold loves to grow. And again, hmm. So, you know, you guys know what it takes for mold to grow. You need organic material, you need uh, a moisture source, and, and then a mold spore. So if you have those, those conditions, you're going to get mold growth. And, and then again, there's the right, need to be a fairly good temperature. It needs to be the right temperature, mm-hmm. which is the temperatures that we enjoy as well. And, and maybe a little cooler, yeah. maybe a little warmer, but it's, it's going to live kind of in the same places that we can endure. So, but mold also needs in order for mold to grow well, it needs to have very low airflow. So if there's low airflow and there's organic material and a little bit of moisture, all of a sudden it has the right conditions to grow. And we live in the Pacific Northwest. So there's enough moisture in the air most of the time of the year that mold naturally can grow in a lot of different places. So one of the key things for most people is I'll, I'll pull out, I have a little hygrometer. You can get them for super cheap, but I've got a nicer one. You can put a hygrometer in a room. And if the hygrometer is over 60% humidity in the room, at above 60% humidity, mold can start growing on multiple surfaces. Most of the time, mm. mold needs to be like, in a, like it needs uh, a certain amount of moisture. So if there's an active leak, mold can grow there because there's enough water. As soon as you get above 60% humidity, all of a sudden mold can kind of grow on anything organic. It can grow on sheetrock. What it loves though first and what I'll check first is leather. So go into a closet, I'll look at the leather shoes, I'll look at you know, leather belts, or if there's like a guitar case, guitar cases are super notorious for mold. I'll look for things like that in a closet space. And if it's there present now, you can see it's going to be in a lot of other places. So closets, one of the first things I check. Um, and again, it's because there's low airflow in closets. There, there's usually doors in front of them. They're not, there's not windows, there's not 
air movement. They usually don't have ventilation like air, uh, like your, your normal air vents that are pushing hot or cold air into your home are usually not in closets. They're in, in the rooms uh, where people sleep and live. So closets, there's no airflow. It's low light and the organic material in great abundance. So I'll check there first. And then, then I start probing around in areas that uh, that there's moisture so, or water. So you're going to look at laundry rooms. I, I take a moisture meter and I'll use that to probe around behind the wall where the piping is at. And we'll check obviously for any areas that are they're moist in laundry rooms, bathrooms, kitchen sinks. And then a lot of times I'll peek under the home in the crawl space and look for plumbing issues that can be present. And then of course, in, in a place that you always have to check in the Pacific Northwest is the attic. Um, some homes, just have seemed like it's interesting how you said that in, in Asia people will build their homes to orient airflow. Um, attics, it's amazing just by the way that a home, the direction that it's facing, you can have all of the right things in place. You can have, you know, good uh, a ridge vent. You can have the soffits in the top to make airflow, and soffits in the bottom to make airflow. But the way that the home sometimes can just be funky, and it's not air isn't passing through it very well. And all of a sudden, mold can just be kind of growing on a lot of different surfaces. Um, usually when mold is in the attic, it's ventilation related. So there's just insufficient ventilation. The air isn't flowing. And then you'll get warm air that comes up from the home. And in the wintertime, a little bit of cool air from the outside. And then it creates condensation on the roof decking. And there'll be just a light layer of mold on a lot of things like that. So those are the places that I check uh, when doing like a, a just basic inspection on someone suspecting mold. Uh, but those are the required like elements of what it needs. It, again, it needs organic material, right moisture level, and a mold spore. Once you find the mold, what processes do you usually go through to remediate the home? So my approach is really unique, and I'm, I understand that. And being in this industry, when I started this, I had kind of thought that so that the technology that I kind of is my is my speciality is it's called dry fog technology. And I'll tell a little bit about the technology and then I'll come back to my process because it has changed since I since I've started doing this. I understand that dry fog is not a cure all. It doesn't fix everything. You need to approach mold multifaceted and you have demolition in most cases is going to be depending on the severity is going to be a requirement in a lot of cases but dry fog allows you to minimize the amount of demolition and lower costs and it also i feel like has a lot greater reach in a lot of ways so dry fog basically is it's humidity and what we're doing is we use the the home as an enclosed space we fill up the home with uh, an antimicrobial product that's used for mold and it's released in the form of a, a very fine water vapor. In order for it to be considered dry fog, the size of the water particle or more, excuse me, not water particle, the chemical product has to be, the droplet has to be less than 10 microns, which is, I, I don't know, I think that the size of a typical hair is like 100 or 50 microns or something like that. So it's very, very small. And it comes out in the form of humidity and it fills up the entire environment. So humidity in a home, it's not going to necessarily land on a surface and get things wet. It will just make the air space damp. And why that's powerful and why that's effective is because the humidity will penetrate deep into every space and corner that, that no matter how hard you scrub or spray a certain area, you're never going to be able to touch everything. No matter how hard you try, you can't scrub everything. That would take an impossible amount of time. But humidity can. Humidity can wrap around things. It can seep into things. It can touch areas that you just can't reach. It gets into the HVAC. It seeps into the, the carpet fibers, the couches, your clothing. And mold a lot of times, again, this lady that, that I'm working with right now, her mold response is so severe that even having just a few spores in her clothing can cause a reaction. And she's been having these reactions so frequently that even in small doses, it can be very, like very, very difficult, very unfortunate. Mm. So this process is good in a lot of ways. It's powerful in that it can reach a lot of places. My process again has changed though. Um, I, depending on the scenario, if it is in this scenario, this lady, most of the mold is contained in the attic and that air has been seeping into her living space. 
We've done moisture probes and checking in numerous places in the rest of the home. There's no active leaks. There's no, uh, it, we've not found mold growing anywhere in the living space of her home, which was actually pretty good because most homes are gonna find it in a couple of places. Um, so it's, there's not any growing on anything in her home. And, and it, the hygrometer reflected that as well. The, you know, it was like at a 50% humidity. So it would be difficult for mold to grow in there without an active leak. There were no active leaks that we could find. So this mold was coming from her attic space. So treatment didn't require any demolition. We went up, we treated the mold that was in the attic, or he's actually literally, my, my uh, technician's doing this actually right now as we speak. He's treating the attic mold right now. And then at that same time, he's running uh, our machine in the main living space of the home, putting this product out into the air. And that is doing what I call spatial decontamination. It's pushing this product down. And the product is a typical mold product or mold remediation product. The active ingredients are very commonly used in almost every mold remediation chemical, primarily a hydrogen peroxide, which is a great way to, it oxidizes and it breaks down to a water vapor, make, basically making a very eco-friendly safe product. And again, it just kind of reaches and, and touches every surface, every thing that the that humidity can reach to. As long as it's not an enclosed space, like uh, if a drawer is closed and it's airtight, humidity is not gonna really get into that space. Oh. Well, that's fascinating because that's exactly what we do. Um, well, <laughs> metaphorically, I should say. So the herbs that are used have these really big volatile oil pockets in them. And the yeah. nastier yeah. the environment, the bigger the volatile oil pockets. And really, that's what we're doing from inside the body is essentially fumigating using these volatile oil pockets. And then also signaling gases like nitric oxide, which in the right dose, have an effect of killing mold and helping to eliminate mold uh, toxins out of the body. So That's yeah, it's also, a, an, it's an aromatic approach. I mean, um, if people have water retention, it would be like a flooded basement, then we'll increase urination, increase sweating to get that extra water out of the body. And then ultimately we're also fumigating in a sense. I'm, I'm curious really though, fascinating. I wanted yeah, to ask, uh, what's the difference in cost for people? Because generally when people are like, Oh God, I got mold. I've got to knock out some walls in my house. It's going to be 50,000 bucks for a small area. Uh, yeah. What is the cost difference with the approach that you're taking? It's significantly less in most cases. So it depends on the, on the job, but if it's a job that would normally for like a typical mold remediation company, if they approach it with, with hammers that they're going to go on and rip out walls and replace things, the price tag can be, astronomically high, $50,000 $50, in some cases more, right? Um, it's like a major me, a typical jump. It is. It's essentially, it, it's demolition and reconstruction. And then they basically contain yeah. the space, run some air scrubbers and put on a Tyvek scoot and, and spray it with a, a mold killer. That, that's most typical mold remediation. Our process, when we can avoid demolition and we try to minimize that as much as possible. So in this case, for this lady, we're doing this for, I would guess, probably a third of the cost or less of what, what most people pay. Most of my jobs are, and again, I, I hate saying this because I don't want to be held, held accountable to this to someone in the future, but most of my jobs are under $2,000. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. That is, yeah, that's incredible. That's a significant savings, especially when yeah. people have to uproot their lives and move to other places. That's right. Jeez. And, uh, I imagine folks need to be out of the house while the, the dry fog process is going on, right? That's not something, right. I mean, you're not supposed to be breathing high concentrations of hydrogen peroxide. So exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah. people, yeah. people vacate the place. We've also found too. So most plants, so I, I had a job. I didn't never notice it until I had a job where this one lady had like 250 plants in her home, like just a ton of plants. Mm. Oh. And uh, we put a ton of product out there and about, 50 plants died. I felt horrible. I, I gave her a yeah. big discount on the, on the job and re, re but the, the hydrogen peroxide on certain leaves will actually, it will oxidize it and dry it out. Yeah. And, which is what it's yeah. supposed to do. And the cool thing is you can see the effect that it has on organic materials. So if it runs into a pathogen in the air, then this is the cool thing is this product in the process doesn't just kill mold in the air and mold spores. Again, we were doing we were initially doing this for COVID. And again, we can't say that this kills COVID because it, you know, you have to be right. careful how you say those things, but it, it kills pathogens. It kills viruses. It kills bacteria. It kills germs. It's going to kill mold spores. 
our ability. So this is, the, I actually was going to say this earlier, this technology originates in the pharmaceutical industry for cleaning and sterilizing a pharmaceutical clean room. Mm-hmm. When they yeah. sterilize. Hydrogen peroxide is amazing. It's, it's a, I mean, I don't know why we don't use it more. There's all these other types of cleaning cleaners wow. like bleach and Lysol. <laughs> They're terrible for you. These products are really yeah. not good. And hydrogen peroxide is pretty darn safe. And it's a fantastic antimicrobial or, and uh, it, it, oxidant. And again, it breaks down to water vapor when it's done. So it's pretty darn safe. Wow, that is excellent. So right now, where are people finding you? Because all of the patients that, you know, that we're seeing, all of our colleagues are seeing, um, the first thing is, I think anybody who suspects mold should be looking to get, uh, to get the house tested, you know, especially mm-hmm. when one or more family members have recurrent sinusitis or just signs of fungal infection due to water retention or other signs that we look for. What would be the first step someone should take? So you want to find obviously someone to perform some testing to confirm it. So we, we do inspections. There are obviously a lot of companies that can do inspections. Some of them do free inspections. We do a free inspection. Um, air tests are, they're tricky because like you said, someone can open the door to their home and mold is, it's naturally occurring in the environments we live in, even outside it's everywhere. Um, but our body is able to handle certain amounts of mold and types of mold that are naturally occurring outside. When we do an air test, there's always usually an indoor and an outdoor control. So you compare the outdoor test, the indoor, and if the indoor has got a significantly higher amount of penicillium aspergillus category or cladosporium, which are all very typical airborne molds, those are what you're going to see. And all of a sudden, if the spore count is five times higher or 10 times higher than what you'd see outside, then you know there's something environmentally happening inside that would make that. Then obviously this, the inspection itself is going to reveal that in some cases when we find it on surfaces in different areas in a home will do either a, you can do a bulk sample you can do a tape or a swab you send it into a lab it's going to tell you the type of mold and if it's like an air test it'll give a spore count of how many are in the air so to know for sure again you want to probably have an inspection done i think again though there's a lot of things that people can tell on their own uh, some of the things i've just shared you can go and look in your closet and in some of these places, check under your sinks. If you see that look or have that smell, you're gonna sense that and it's gonna be there. So that's, that's gonna at least get you the first step from there. You can call a mold remediation person, come and go to take the next step from there. But it, you wanna have a professional eye on it for sure. Not everyone can afford to have a professional eye. That's why we always offer free inspections. But when you're yeah. having major health problems, it's good to have a professional eye come and take a look at it. It's been hard when I've worked with a patient here where I suspect that the mold issue that they're dealing with is coming from inside their home. A lot of them have had a really difficult time finding somebody who, um, uh, who can do a, a comprehensive inspection like that and, um, uh, and then even offer any kind of substantial remediation help aside from like, like we were saying, like a major remodel. You know, it's the real estate market in this part of the world is kind of insane. And so like, yeah, you know, getting a home inspector, like you would have, if you're going to buy a house, come out and do something for you is it, it can take weeks and, you know, and then like, good luck getting a, a contractor, <laughs> you know, I know on top of just the, the, the crazy expenses involved with it and, you know, lifestyle upheaval involved in all that. So I, this is great that you guys have this, this service available. Yeah. And, and the demand is high right now. We're trying to keep up with demand, which is we are hiring and building and growing it at, as fast as we can. But it's uh, again, yeah, the market here is, is the housing market is causing a, a huge demand on us. I my The people sure. I love working with are the people that are having health problems. I would say still probably 75% of what's keeping us really busy is just, you know, home inspection was done. Mold is found in the attic. We go out, we remediate it. But the ones that I find the most satisfaction in is when people are having uh, a major kind of allergic reaction to mold. Yeah, you're able to really of, help turn their lives around. Yeah, because a lot of these people, again, they're like, do I have to move? Do I need to sell my home? Do I need to burn all my clothes? Like, Because uh, this is sometimes what a lot of people feel like they have to do because they, they put on their clothes and all of a sudden they're having an allergic reaction. They go into their kitchen, they have an allergic reaction. And it gets more, it gets progressively worse. So 
being able to have a, a, a an option that allows them to not lose everything or, or feel like they're not going crazy is is helpful. So that's the that's the part of the job I enjoy the most for sure. Awesome. And it's also a lot of preventative when you think about it, just getting it out of there in the first place, then, you know, new family moves in with a crib right below that, you know, the oh, kids man. could be oh. really screwed up. Oh yeah. man. I, and again, everyone's allergic response is different, but I always, uh, yeah, I've been to jobs before where there was a major homes where there was a major, major mold problem and it had been there for probably 20, 30 years and there's kids living in the home. And in some cases, in fact, the most unfortunate situation I see, it's often the case, is it's a landlord tenant situation. Mm -hmm. Tenant has yeah. got major health problems or their kids are in this really, really bad environment. And I have to tell this landlord, say, hey, this is a major health issue. These people, I'm not a medical doctor. I can't give medical advice, but I can tell you from personal experience, this is not a safe place for these people to be. I'm finding high levels of this type of mold, this type of mold. And I can see from these people that they're not doing well. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a medical expert, but they're not doing well. You probably should address this. And the landlord's like, well, you know, we, it is what it is. Can you just, can we just spray some bleach on it? And I'm like, no, that's not going to fix it. You, 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 yeah. And, and those are the ones that are really challenging, but I, yeah, those situations where there's either a situation that doesn't get fixed and they're selling the home. So I've done it, but because I offer free inspections, a lot of times I get realtors that are just like, great, come, come give me a bid and we're going to use it for negotiation and we'll never have you do the, the, the service. And mm -hmm. it is what it is. It's like, I don't care if that's, it happens, but we'll go and give the inspection. We'll find sometimes really bad scenarios. And because right now the housing market is such where it's, it's a seller's market. Sellers can be like, we don't have to deal with this. Take it or leave it. If you don't yeah. buy this home, someone else will. And in, uh, in my own heart, I'm just like, that is not a good thing to put someone else in this situation. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's scary sometimes to think about, again, you don't know this stuff until you're here. Again, a year and a half, two years ago, I knew nothing about this. And I, I feel like to a great extent, I don't know if I could ever buy a home without knowing that it's a safe environment for my family. Yeah, that's, and that turns into a lot of the weird diseases we see down the line, even uh, cases of obesity. Hey, Brian, you were up a hundred pounds at one point in your life, right? Yeah. 150 from where I am now. Yeah. Oh, wow. 150 pounds. That's a lot. Of, that's yeah. Crazy. I, was, I was, I was very, very, <laughs> I was 365. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I mean, I have a, uh, it's, it was a, something that started in childhood and, um, I don't know about any mold growing in the house I grew up in, but um, my dad still lives there. He doesn't have any major health problems, but um, just living in a damp environment like this certainly affected it. And um, yeah, uh, it's, um, I think um, being exposed to, to that kind of air quality, um, I'm certain I was, you know, in my friend's houses that had mold, um, we know it messes with water metabolism and food cravings and all, you know, it's, it changes your microbiome. It makes you want to eat things that feed it more. This lady again, and I don't know, again, tell me if there's anything to this, this lady that I'm helping right now. Um, she said that all of a sudden she's become allergic to a lot of things that she didn't used to be. Mm -hmm. She's oh, yeah. allergic to, she's allergic to almonds. She's allergic to, she can have allergic reaction to sugars. Yep. Um, and in my own perspective, again, this is, I, I always have to precurse this that I'm not a medical expert because you have to be so careful what you say these days. But obviously from my understanding, eating sugar lowers your immune system's response. Mm -hmm. And if you eat sugar and your immune system is already low, then you can have a response. So and I wanted to ask you is this, so I have suspected this and it makes sense in my mind, but I don't, again, I'm not a medical expert on this, but well, the way I see this happening for a lot of people is that if they're in a moldy environment for an extended period of time, see, my understanding of this is just like any pathogen your body interacts with, it registers, your immune system automatically turns on, it recognizes that there's something not right, 
and then it tries to remediate that and it will attack whatever is wrong. So if that's a virus or bacteria or a mold spore, whatever, your body's immune system goes on high alert and it starts to try to fix this issue. And that's a good thing. Your body's meant to do that. But it would make sense that if that happens continuously, that you're in an environment that is moldy and your body is constantly on high alert. It's constantly switching on, constantly yep. fighting yep. this thing. Eventually your immune system gets fatigued. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my, I have yeah. a mother-in-law and she's got ve very major health issues and she has what's called a, a, a immuno, uh, she's autoimmune disease, but she's immuno fatigued. Her immune system is like, it's exhausted all of the time. She can't, it, she's super quick to get sick for all sorts of things because her immune system is constantly under attack. And yeah. because of that, all of a sudden she's more susceptible to get a cold. She's more susceptible to get the flu. She's more susceptible to get all of these other things because her immune system is exhausted. So all of these symptoms are all these sicknesses that you could go to the doctor for and say, I've got the flu. I've got this. I've got that could to some extent be traced back to having mold in your home and your body's immune system is just exhausted. Yeah. It's a, it's a is major, immune, it, it, yeah, it's a major immune stimulant. And so it's, it's one of these things where it's like, you know, going to a rock concert once in a while can be a fun experience living with 150 decibels of, you know, electric guitar and heavy bass in your eardrums constantly is, is going to make you go deaf. And, you know, it's like, we're, we have immune systems that need to be stimulated. You put somebody in a completely sterile environment and they're going to get a whole other set of medical problems. But if the immune system is constantly being like, you are supposed to be consistently exposed to things in your world. That's, that's healthy. We're, we're evolved to adapt. We're well evolved to, to deal with that. But if there's a pathogen that is consistently attacking you and your body isn't able to um, create like a, like once you've had a virus, you have antibodies against that virus you know, theoretically forever or hopefully. Um, and so that particular virus, you can get exposed to it again. Um, the way that like mold toxins work, you, we don't create an antibody to that, that then persists in the same way. It's more like, um, consistently being, yeah, it's more like consistently being exposed to a pesticide or, uh, you know, accumulating a heavy metal or, or something like that. It's, it's, it's a little bit more of a, um, like a consistent buildup of, of, of problems. And so you, we find these people who are, their immune system is kind of overloaded by this. They're um, a couple uh, pictures we see are like, like you described this person who, you know, like they're, they're just always sick. Now um, they catch everything. Um, we find, see a lot of people who accumulate these kinds of old infections. Um, they oftentimes either have gone through a period of time in their life where they had like uh, these, episodic fevers that would just come on for a long time. And then that, that went away, or they just can't really remember the last time that they actually had a high fever, but they they oftentimes will have like a low body temperature and chronic low grade fever too, or chronic yeah, or yeah, yeah. Low grade. Cause that's the other thing that uh, mold likes to do. And, and mold isn't, yeah, mold is bad, but it has buddies, you know, an entourage yeah. effect, right? It's like you go yeah. into the woods and you see something rotting. It's not like one bacteria is rotting. It's, you know, one gets in and it creates a little bit of a opening and then others just opportunistically get in there. Yeah, and right. one of the effects are that uh, there are pathogens which will raise your body temperature if they want you warmer. And there are pathogens which will lower your body temperature. They hijack the hypothalamus in the brain. And then they'll keep the body temperature low just at that sweet spot where mold can live. Because if we're... Um, really at 98.6 and, you know, then we're exercising and sweating every day. We're running, you know, like kind of natural state of things. We're designed to kill fungi and mold, but the average body temperature has dropped in the last 20 years, Interesting. possibly due to who knows, sedentary lifestyle, uh, plastics, it's multifaceted. It's hard to say, but one aspect is that there are pathogens which will actively lower our body temperature, making us more susceptible to anything. And then from there, it's a downward spiral. And then there's also two aspects, like the mold and pathogens will be affecting us. 
the body sometimes, if it can't really decide, all right, I know that bacteria, I know that virus, if it's a generalized infection, especially with something that's hiding out in the spaces between cells, the body goes generalized inflammation. So it'd be like, there's a lot of crime coming from this neighborhood. If the police know everybody in that neighborhood, they can just, uh, you know, go pick up JR and Jethro and <laughs> bring them down because they're selling meth again or whatever it is. But if they don't know, then they're just like, all right, uh, let's just call in some bombs. And that's what the immune system does. And that's why it causes cellular damage. It causes more, um, causes more neural damage and the more neural damage in the area, then the communication is down. So now you've got this ghetto bad area of town where people are selling meth and you've dropped bombs on it. And now you can't even communicate. You've lost your Intel for the area. And then mm -hmm. it just makes it, that's one way it kind of makes it worse over time. And add in a blanket curfew to that too. So then, you know, once the, once the bomb dust is cleared, anybody who's out on the street, we're going after you. That's you right. Know, they don't. And that's where autoimmune diseases yep. or presentations yep. that look like autoimmune disease, like fibromyalgia, a lot of that stuff comes in as a result of that. So yes. Yeah. It, it gets very messy once it gets involved. Do you guys have a lot of, uh, patients that their medical doctors have prescribed them or uh, not prescribed them, but have diagnosed them with things like fibromyalgia and anxiety and, and yeah. And Lyme yeah. disease. And it, they often don't disease. know it. and yeah. depression and anxiety. Depression's huge because yeah. just feeling like you're under attack. People will say, I moved to this house and I started having bloody nightmares or nightmares of ghosts. Like, yeah, your immune system's on alert and then generalized anxiety. I feel, I don't know what it is. I just feel like something's coming after me. Like, well, it is. <laughs> you know, it's, that's your, your, you know, your inflammation is off the charts because your body's fighting something. So yeah, that, that tends to come together. And then rheumatologists will refer a lot to us as well, because they'll be like, this isn't RA. I can't really tell what it is. And so we'll look at it. And then from our perspective, you know, we can tell that there's water retention. We can tell that there are, uh, signs and symptoms of the way that fungi and similar entourage pathogens will attack. So we don't zero it in on, on one thing, but because it is such an entourage, we were just looking at remediating the house, uh, the body as a house, I should say. But when we see these signs, you know, that's one thing that we're just blind to is what's the actual environment of the house and how is it making right. them sick? The indoor air pollution is huge. Yeah. So I'm curious, I mean, I'm sure it varies by person, but for people that you work with, what's the typical turnaround time from the, I, do you guys have to try different combinations or have you guys found different like specific medicines that have pretty good effects over a short period of time? Like what, how long does it take from like, let's say just an average person who comes in, it's got mm -hmm. an, an issue with mold. I don't know what, what the term would be mold damage. Mm -hmm. illness injury yeah. yeah mold illness injury what's the turnaround time how long does it take for those people to kind of get feeling better okay so there's two answers to this one is if they're doing all of the bullshit that they read online that is generally for self-help for mold remediation it will take them years if they don't do any of that and instead go hit a sauna and then come in for a uh, herbal prescription that's customized for them we're looking at improved symptoms within 48 hours at about two weeks, they start to see pretty significant differences. What we look for generally is we assess the three main microbiomes of the body, respiratory, uh, gastrointestinal, and urogenital. And we look for signs and symptoms in these areas. We look for kind of that first domino of, you know, just like you would check for the attic or the basement or the closet, kind of just look for where it is, address where it is a lot of those symptoms will start to go away pretty quickly after that initial phase, which can be anywhere from two weeks to a month. Uh, then they start to build up. We transition them a little bit so that they build up. The buildup phase is actually much easier because, you know, there are vitamins, there's sunshine exercise. There are a lot of ways that you can build up where our focus is mainly targeting exactly where the damage is, getting it out. And then the turnaround time, uh, what I've personally seen from severe mold damage in China and the U S is 
at about three months, the cells can regenerate for really severe diseases where, you know, some people are just like it, literally in a coma or fractions of themselves, right? That will take about three years of them kind of daily getting stronger to be kind of back to where they were. What do you, yeah. What's your experience, the, Brian? The, the very similar in many respects. Um, the thing I'll add to that is the, 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 for the people who are extremely sensitive, like where, you know, the, 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 the air blows the wrong way, even if they're outdoors and, and that triggers a flare, that's the thing that we, that takes the longest to really, to, to mitigate. So, you know, it's like, you can, we do our best to like help them get out of a moldy situation via the house or some find a remediation company, et cetera. We're treating them internally. Um, oftentimes as long as they're not getting re-exposed that, that progress back to health occurs very quickly. Like it's, it's a matter of weeks until they're feeling significant improvement. Um, and, but when they're so, so, so sensitized that even the slightest bit of re-exposure can, can set them off again, reducing that sensitivity just takes a long time. Um, it's, it's sort of like, a, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. Um, it, if you have a, um, like a, a post-traumatic experience and, you know, where, you know, say you're, you're involved in a war and then any sound that reminds you of that or personal situation that reminds you of that, um, or, you know, visual episode or something like that, that can put you back into that traumatic mindset. Um, and even if you go through trauma therapy, you can still be re-exposed to that and, and, uh, and be, be reactivated again. Um, mold exposure can be, have a similar, like kind of phenomenon on the body and, and, um, just anecdotally, I'll say the, the people that I see this in the most are the ones who, have become quite sensitized to mold and then experience some kind of a, a neurological injury, like a physical injury, like a concussion or a, um, a traumatic brain injury of some kind. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't dug deep enough to really determine uh, physiologically exactly what that phenomenon is. I suspect there's some injury to the blood brain barrier at that point, which allows the, the, uh, mold illness or the mold based injury to get deeper into the brain. But, um, that's it'll, where it'll also change a lot of... the gut microbes immediately. Brain injury yes. will immediately affect gut microbiota. Yeah. And then of course, yeah, regulation that's... of, Im uh, of inflammation. So yeah, just, yeah. uh, before and I forget the Oregon, uh, the Oregon has a traumatic brain association, a traumatic brain injury association. Actually, my mom is a a psychologist and she was in charge of it for a number of years. She was leading oh, wow. that. Yeah. And a number of those people are there because of mold damage and uh, mm -hmm. either due to a traumatic brain injury or because they were in a mold filled house that caused such acute neurological damage that they're just learning how to deal with that long-term. So mm -hmm. yeah, those wow. are definitely people who yeah. Could use some help. No problem. I'm surprised I haven't been interrupted yet. I've got, we just had number five. Number we, what? Oh, yeah, God. I know. They keep showing up. I don't know what's going on. I got twins this year and uh, man, <laughs> five. Man, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. I don't know if you guys remember, there's a comedian, I can't remember his name. He, he, he uh, Jim Gaffigan. Uh -huh. And he does this. Oh one yeah, on, he does this one on home birth. They've got, I think, four or five kids, and and he gets up and he says, you know, people sometimes ask me what it's like to have, you know, a bunch or four kids, and he says, imagine that you're drowning. This is my favorite quote. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Imagine that you're drowning and someone hands you a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That is very much what it's like. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, good for you. That's fantastic. Congrats. So you had this year, you had twins. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 11 months ago, I guess it's about today. So, Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I'm just able to do, uh, do interviews again because I, I mean, just even a week or so ago, I was absolutely brain dead. So yeah, it's, I know I can relate. I'm right there now again. We just, yeah, literally we had number five, uh, 
a week ago Saturday. So a little, almost two weeks. Oh, ago. wow. Actually, no, t- today is Saturday. So it's two weeks ago today. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, uh, first, I got to ask. Yeah. So how can people get a hold of you? So uh, best way to, to, to reach out to me is, is through, uh, I, I, most of the time a phone call is the best way or text. I respond to text usually a little bit faster. And I only really service kind of the greater Portland area and then the North Coast from Astoria down to maybe in the Halem or I, I've, got, I've done a few times down a little bit further than that, but I don't go much further than that. And kind of the greater Portland area, I don't really service Salem or anything like that yet. We are wanting to grow and expand and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to service those areas in the future, but a, a phone call is best or text. If you want, I can obviously get my phone number and they can reach out. Sounds yeah, I was going to say, do you do you do down into the Willamette Valley? I'm in McMinnville, and um, the uh, yeah, we we need your help down here. I love McMinnville. That area is awesome, and I if I literally if I could uproot and move somewhere, it would probably be McMinnville. I love that area. I think it's so beautiful. <laughs> I know that sounds strange, but I I really really no, really. No, it's like always got rainbows. Area. There's wine country. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's beautiful. I do, yeah, I do occasionally good. do services down there. What we've considered doing is because again, we don't charge for inspections and we do spend mm-hmm. a lot of time driving around doing inspections. We sure. thought that maybe we would just start charging a small fee for areas that are kind of outside of our service area. You should definitely and, do that. Uh, just hire some additional personnel to allow us to kind of zip around and cover some of those further out areas. Yeah. So just I hope cover I'm, your gas and time and everything. That's Yeah. Yeah. I, again, initially when we, we got this going, the goal was just to, to get as much experience as possible and to help as many people as we could. And now we're at a place where we're just kind of overwhelmed with, we've got a pretty high demand and uh, we're, we're just trying to keep up with what we've got. So we've got a lot of growing pains, but hopefully here in the next year, we'll be servicing a lot more of, of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. Is your bottleneck right now being able to hire people? Yes. That's a major issue. Actually, that that's probably the main issue. Um, what kind of folks are you looking for? Because I mean, you've been growing fast, obviously you're going to yeah. keep growing and if uh, we can help it, we're going to bother you with more people. So. Good. I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I, I would say finding the for me, I am very, very picky on the type of people I hire and it's, mm-hmm. I love to help people. And there's a lot of people I think that are looking for jobs, but a lot of the work we do is in attic spaces and you need to have someone that feels comfortable climbing into an attic that can Mm -hmm. walk across rafters and not step through someone's ceiling. And uh, that can sometimes be challenging. I also, for me, I place a really high value on people's ability to communicate. Um, One of the things that I I've focused really heavily on is being able to have good communication interaction with customers because people's personal experience in the end is so important. If you can't, you, you could be an absolutely fantastic mold remediation guy, but if you go in and you don't treat people well, or you don't communicate with people well, they're only going to remember that you were a jerk or you didn't tell them when you were going to show up or that you were late or whatever, or mm-hmm. that if you were going to be late, you didn't tell them. And that's, what's going to kind of run their experience. So h- hiring the people that can uh, be responsible and capable and communicate with people in a good way that, that is um, yeah. And again, help people feel understood because I can't, the, again, the people that I run into that are in the situation where they're, they're looking for people like you, I oftentimes, by the time people have found you, it's like, they're at their end of the rope. And I, when mm-hmm. I run into those people, they think people are telling them they're crazy. And if you have someone that isn't very tactful about that, it, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, and God, if you can catch it early too, like if somebody oh, yeah. gets hit with mold mm-hmm. and they don't do the like charcoal cleanses, which just eat up their intestines and make them even more uh, susceptible. It can be like a week or two and they're done. Oh yeah. Basically all the advice out there is um, yeah. It's like, it's just 1970s natural health advice. And they're like, do all of it out of all of that. The only advice that's generally good is hit a sauna, especially initially you're going to raise your body temperature and start to kill off some of the mold. Um, that's basically the only advice they have. That's good. All of the rest of it will actively make people worse. And that's why they're wow. I've avoid been in this, sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Avoid sugar. Don't eat garbage for a while. Hit a sauna. Most yeah. people will like 80, 20 principle. If people just hit a sauna, make sure they're having a bowel movement every day. They're going to get better pretty fast. Just, just with that. 
That's uh, I, that's sound advice. I for me, I actually I usually try and give, particularly for the landlord tenant situations where someone is in a situation and they they don't have control over it. The tenant doesn't have control over it. A lot of times, I I will make the recommendation. I, you know, I know that you don't have control over a lot of this, but get a dehumidifier. So things that people can do on their mm -hmm. own if mm -hmm. they don't have control over getting the remediation portion done, maybe a, a landlord tenant situation, the landlord isn't dealing with the problem, get a dehumidifier and get the humidity below 60%. It's a mm -hmm. very easy thing to do. And in the Pacific Northwest, we're fortunate enough that the weather for the most, a lot of the time is good enough that we can open the windows sometimes more often than a lot of places and allow air to flow through the home. If you can get that airflow moving, you're going to flush those bad toxins out and allow good, clean, fresh air to come in. And, and then in the other advice I have is just, and it doesn't, not everyone can, but be out of the home as much as you can get outdoors, go be in places where there's mm -hmm. good air and, and breathe a lot of that air in as much as you can. If you can, if you're in a room that's got mold, maybe crack the window and just allow some clean air to come in. Cause I, there are a lot of people that just, they don't do that. And they're in a room that's got bad mold. They've got the, I went into a home, actually, this one was one that was really Unfortunately, it was a landlord tenant situation and the, the wife was super sick. The little girl, she was three years old and was super sick. And that one just was heartbreaking because I've got a three-year-old little girl and, mm. and uh, they were both having very strong reactions. The dad wasn't because he was working. He was out of the home a lot, but they were, and they were in an older home and the heat, the home was kind of so drafty that they had the heat on blast all of the time. And they had sealed the windows with like plastic and blankets so it was creating a super super damp and hot environment just a prime place for mold the humidity was like it was like 75 percent humidity in the air and it was like probably 75 degrees in there as well and there was mold on everything on everything i mean things that wouldn't have been normally grown it was everywhere so just again oh have airflow. And that's what I told them. We're taking, you got to take all this plastic off and I know that their heating bill is going to go up a little bit because you mm -hmm. are opening the windows, but you got to get these windows open. You got to get this stuff flushed out. I did some treatment form for free just because it was, it was bad enough. They needed it. And the landlord wasn't going to do it, but we got, they, they told me you need to get all the plastic off and just get air flowing through here. If you do nothing else, but just get airflow through your home and get a dehumidifier and get your, your, your um, humidity level below 60%, this will do a ton to address the issue. It's not going to fix it, but it will, it will help a lot. So if, you know, your, your listeners, if there's advice I would have in situations where you can't remediate it and it's outside your control, do that. And that will help a lot.